Hudson River Sloop Clearwater, Newburgh Clean Water Project, Scenic Hudson, and Sierra Club. Um, today, you'll hear from a range of panelists on the proposed Dan Scammer expansion, um, which, as you will learn, poses a serious threat to the health and quality of life for residents in the Hudson Valley region, as well as for our climate. We have, like I said, a pretty stacked schedule today of amazing speakers, so um, we're just going to get started. Um, so take it away, Mana. Okay, I have to share my screen. I'm so sorry. It'll just take a minute to do that. Share screen. And here we go. Share. And from the beginning, sorry about this. Okay. Slideshow and from present slide, does that work? Are you guys seeing that? Yep. Okay, so, oh, that's from the end. <laughs> Let's get to the beginning, sorry about this. Okay, so here we are. Um, this is a uh, dance camera facility, the current facility on Dance Camera Point, and you can see that it is um, on a peninsula in the Hudson River. Uh, unfortunately, it's a very flood prone area and we'll hear more about that. Um, so this is um, a little bit of the background. Uh, Dance Scammer was built in 1950. Uh, by Central Hudson, and um, then in the 1990s, when New York's uh, energy system was deregulated, uh, they had to sell off their generating infrastructure, and and so they did. Um, they they sold that to Dynegy. <laughs> Let's see. Um, and then uh, at, in 2000, EPA determined that Dan Scammer was amongst the top 10 polluting uh, facilities in New York State, um, you know, releasing 1.4 million pounds or 700 tons of hazardous material into Newburgh's air, land, and water. Um, Riverkeeper sued Dynegy because it's once through cooling system was responsible for killing uh, large numbers of Hudson River fish. Um, and Dynegy also um, went to uh, the beneficiaries of the taxes they were paying, Orange County, Town of Newburgh, and the Marbletown School District and they claimed they had been overvalued. And so they got into a lawsuit with them. Uh, in 2011, they filed for bankruptcy. And uh, in 2012, they were sued by Sierra Club Earth Justice and others who, uh, because of the large amount of pollution, were trying to get them to improve their pollution control devices. And then uh, in November 2012, the workers um, at uh, both Roseton and Dynegy, and, and Dan Scammer rather, went on strike uh, because the company was trying to strip away the hard earned pension benefits and retirement uh, benefits. So, um, they were now in trouble with, they were in financial trouble and they were in trouble with the municipality. Um, during the years that Dan Scammer burned coal, uh, the, the facility had six units, two coal-fired uh, plants with so-called natural gas as um, a backup. I say so-called because now methane gas is mainly um, obtained by fracking. There's very little natural gas that's um, easily obtained. 
um, to oil-fired facilities, to emergency generators, and they took 450 million gallons of Hudson River cooling, cooling water um, to run their system and killed uh, millions of uh, fish eggs and larvae by entrainment in the system or by thermal pollution. Um, the coal burning facility also generated a huge amount of coal ash, which was piled on the hillside behind the plant um, and ultimately leaked into the groundwater with high levels of uh, various chemicals and heavy metals. Um, and then in October of 2012, we had Superstorm Sandy and the flood damage sustained during that facility uh, caused the plant to be closed. And the New York ISO, which um, runs New York's grid, grid and, and tries to assure um, reliability, had considered this a mothballed facility. But at that time, Dan Scammer Energy was formed for the sole purpose of returning the facility to operation. And it did. In 2014, uh, Dan Scammer reopened. Um, and uh, let's see, we can see it a little better. Um, and it was repowered by. Uh, gas with oil as a backup. It provided and provides, uh, up, it has a capacity to provide 537 megawatts, which is about a quarter of what Indian Point um, provided. Now it's about half because unit two is closed and unit three will be closing next year. But just to give you a perspective, it runs less than 5% of the year to meet peak demand, particularly on hot summer days or very cold winter days. And it runs on methane gas-fired turbines, four methane gas-fired turbines with a unit with a number six fuel oil as a backup. Also uses 450 million gallons a day of Hudson River uh, water through its once through cooling system and has um, and continues to emit pollutants into the air. Um, and uh, New York pays companies to maintain excess power even when they're not running. Um, to assure that there's power available during peak demand. And Dan Scammer receives $30 million a year from this program. Um, and uh, it only operates a few days a year, but it earns 10 to $20 million in capacity payments. So now we come to the proposed expansion the year-round gas fire plan that will cost investors $40 million. It will run instead of less than 5% of the year, 70% of the time. It will use fracked so-called natural gas as a primary fuel with low sulfur diesel as a backup. It has an air-cooled condensing system so it doesn't need to use Hudson River water, so that's a plus. Um, and it has advanced uh, pollution control, but even in spite of that, it still will generate more pollution and in particular more greenhouse gases. It does generate more pollution and more greenhouse gases. Um, so, uh, I just want people to be, sure, be clear that the reason that this facility is being proposed is the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission's lower Hudson capacity zone. And that was established in May 2014. There were some lawsuits, including uh, Central Hudson and the New York State per, uh, Public Service Commission contested 
this capacity zone, which was going to cost the ratepayers, and it, it allowed for any any fuel, fossil fuel, uh, could have been nuclear, could have been any fuel, rather than focusing that incentive on renewable energy with storage. That was a real bad mistake. Um, the other thing is that adjacent to Dan Scammer, which you can see uh, here, with my, yeah, right here out on the Hudson River, but up the hill is Roseton, and a little further south is Bowline. And so these facilities have cumulative impacts. What about climate change? Well, the sea level, uh, scenic Hudson sea level rise mapper shows that there's very little impact with one foot of climate change, but by the time you get down to uh, four foot of, of uh, sea level rise, you start to see some inundation and the facility is completely inundated um, with six foot of sea level rise. Uh, and there are, environmental and health impacts. We have a whole program on just the health impacts, but the new facility um, does uh, continue to emit uh, greenhouse gases and particulates that will reduce air quality. Um, Newburgh in particular has high asthma rates uh, and other respiratory ailments and also um, is burdened with lead and PFOS in their drinking water. Um, the reduced impacts on the Hudson River, um, the peaker plants are worse than the new proposed plant, but the greenhouse gas emissions um, are worse with the new facility far into the future. And also methane, fugitive methane, um, is released from fracking pipelines, compressor stations, and other transportation, and is a highly potent greenhouse gas. If this facility is built, it will encourage fracking to occur for many years to come. It is clearly time to transition to a green energy economy with which is renewables with storage and efficiency and a power uh, frack gas is not a bridge fuel and a power plant that uses frack gas is not a climate solution. Thank you, thank you for hearing me out. And now I'd like to unshare my screen and introduce Haley Carlock uh, from Scenic Hudson who will talk about the legal process and a few other things. Welcome, Haley. Thanks so much, Mana. I'm so glad to be here. Um, and I'm Haley Carlock, as Mana said, I'm the Director of Advocacy for Cena Cutson, and I'm gonna be speaking today about the process by which um, Dan's camera and other plants like it get approved and um, the things that are considered in that process and also how you can get involved. And Take it from there. So uh, the process by which the state evaluates power plants over 25 megawatts and um, for example, Mana mentioned earlier that the Dan's camera plant would have about a 600 megawatt capacity. So that's obviously many, many times over 25 megawatts. So any medium to large size power plant is approved through a one stop shopping process um, at the state level. So what that means is that um, there's no seeker process. The environmental review is subsumed as part of New York State Public Service Law Article 10. There are no local land use approvals. Uh, for example, um, site plan approval, looking at zoning and variances, that is something that happens through the Article 10 process. There's no local jurisdiction at all. Um, any other state approvals become part of the Article 10 process. There's not, for an example, a separate process for uh, DEC reviewing wetlands um, and so on. Uh, the only other permits that would be um, reviewed and granted outside of the Article 10 process would be any federal permits. And for this project, 
there's one federally one relatively um, insignificant EPA permit that would have to be granted. Um, importantly, while any applicant proposing a power plant does have to try to comply with local laws, even though, again, the local uh, decision makers don't have any direct jurisdiction, those local laws can be waived by the state if they are uh, considered to be unreasonably burdensome to the applicant. And there's, as you might imagine, a lot of discussion and dispute about what exactly unreasonably burdensome means. Um, and while the Article 10 process does take some control from local decision makers and it does take away um, various individual permitting processes, it does really involve a, a quite in-depth review of environmental, public health, energy, and economic issues. Those are all done through this Article 10 process. So who makes the decision then? I mean, we say New York State. But what is, what is the body, what is the agency? Well, there is a specific agency created by the public service law just to make decisions on electric generating plants, uh, major electric generating plants. It's called the Siting Board on Electric Generation and the Environment. It consists of five permanent members who are the heads of the five state agencies you see listed. There's DEC, DOH, uh, the Department of Public Service, Empire State Development, and ICERTA as well as two members drawn from the community in which a specific project would be cited. So there's the five permanent members, and then there's two ad hoc members that change for each and every project. For this project, we do have two local members appointed who are residents of the town of Newburgh, and they are nominated by um, one by the county executive and one by the town supervisor. Um, parties to the proceeding who elect to uh, become full parties are able to file documents on the record, um, be eligible for intervener funding, which I'll talk more about in just a minute, and fully participate in any hearings that are held throughout the process. However, you don't have to become a party in order to weigh in, in order to have your voice heard in the Article 10 process. Any member of the public can submit comments at any time on the docket for this case um, and there will also, uh, at some point down the line, be public statement hearings where the public can um, make their concerns, their thoughts, their position heard to the citing board. Uh, this shows you kind of where we are on the spectrum of the Article 10 process right now. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but it is a very, uh, a very stringent process. There are clear milestones and a, a, a very stringent process that must be followed by the applicant and by any parties to the proceeding. And as you can see, while it, see, it seems like we're in the middle of the process, if you look at this graphic and anyone who's been um, paying close attention to this or been involved in the Article 10 process for this project um, might think that, wow, there's been a lot happening. We've been dealing with this, this project uh, forever. But in fact, we really are just at the uh, onset of the formal process uh, for Article 10. We are really just at the beginning and there's a lot of process, a lot of review, a lot of opportunities for public input that are going to be yet to come. Um, and you can see there what some of those things are and I'll mention them again in just a moment. So going back really quickly to the intervener funds, because I think this is an important thing for people to know, um, Article 10 provides that any applicant or developer needs to submit a fee that will be used by uh, local governments and other stakeholders, nonprofit groups, community groups, local residents, to help them hire legal experts or other subject matter experts and help them fully participate in the proceeding. Um, so Dan's camera pays money into a fund that's held by the state in escrow and then parties can apply and use that funding to help them participate in the process, which is a great um, part of Article 10. And it's something that groups like Sina Hudson um, and other interveners like Riverkeeper and, and the city of Newburgh um, and the city of Beacon have used to help us hire experts to really delve into the details of the project and, and help us really meaningfully participate in the process. And I'm not going to go through everything on this slide, but this just gives you an overview of how the siting board makes a decision and um, what they must consider when they make that decision. And, and there are more details on each of these, but you can see that there's, um, there's no necessary finding that the facility is needed to keep the lights on. I think that's a common misconception that people have 
is that, well, you've got to demonstrate that, you know, your project is really kind of needed to keep uh, reliability, to make sure the lights are on, uh, to make sure there's enough energy on the grid. And that's not the case at all. This is a merchant project. It's not being proposed by a public utility. That's the way some states' uh, systems work. That's not the way New York system works. This is a merchant project. They are proposing the project because they believe it could be profitable for them and will be profitable for them. Um, and so all they have to prove is that it is a beneficial addition. There are some benefits to New York's electric grid, um, that it will serve the public interest, which is defined quite broadly, um, and that environmental impacts will be minimized or avoided. Um, there might be familiar language there for some of you from Seeker. Um, and that if there will be disproportionate environmental impacts in the specific community, and that's defined quite narrowly in this case as the town of Newburgh, then those um, impacts must be offset to the maximum extent practicable. Um, and again, at the end of the process, the siting board can, you know, grant uh, Dan's camera a certificate to build and operate the, their facility. They can deny it flat out. Or another possibility is they could grant it with modifications or conditions to um, the project that uh, the applicant has proposed. So um, in a little more depth where we are now and what we can expect going forward, Dan's Camera Energy submitted their application last December. However, that application is still not considered complete. Um, and completion is the point at which the siting board begins the formal review process. The siting board found the application deficient for a number of reasons, meaning it just didn't include enough information um, on specific things that Article 10 requires. Um, Dan's camera provided additional information in March, and once again, the siting board said, this is still not enough. This still is not enough information um, on which for us to begin our review and decision-making process. And the main issue that is still outstanding is um, Dan's camera's explanation of how its project is consistent with New York State's energy planning objectives, and specifically, how this project is consistent with the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that was passed in 2019. Um, Dan's camera has supplemented their application a couple of times with, with information relevant to that, and the siting board has said, you, you've simply failed to explain how your project can possibly be uh, consistent. We need more information. Dan's camera said, uh, I believe that they would submit yet more information on July 7th, um, they have not submitted it so far. That was sort of a self-imposed deadline. So at this point, the ball's in Dan's camera's court to submit more information on how, how the project is consistent with, with the state's energy uh, policies. And once they submit that information, the siting board will review again, and they will either say, yes, finally, we sort of have enough information to begin the review process, that does not mean that they will grant the certificate necessarily, but they can begin review, or they could come back again and say, there's still not enough information. Importantly though, once the siting board does decide that the application is complete, that starts the clock ticking on a 12 month period within which the siting board must make its final decision. That can be extended up to 18 months if the applicant agrees, but no longer than that. So there is a finite period of time once that application is deemed complete but we don't have any certainty on exactly when that will be. And uh, that is it for this portion of my uh, talk. You'll see me again in a couple of moments to speak on another topic, um, but I'm gonna introduce now Tim Guinea, who is a climate reality project leader here in the Hudson Valley. He leads uh, the Hudson Valley and Catskills chapter, and he is also a professional actor. Take it away, Tim. Hey, everybody. Uh... I am going to talk really quickly about um, the, uh, the, uh, what climate change is going to do to Dan's camera and what Dan's camera is going to do to climate change. And we're a little behind, so I'm really going to rush through this. So uh, just in terms of a primer, in terms of climate change, uh, solar radiation in the form of light waves passes through the Earth's atmosphere, and most of it is absorbed particularly by the dark places like the oceans. Um, some of it, however, is radiated back into space in the form of infrared waves. And some of those waves uh, get trapped by the atmosphere and uh, warm the earth and have created the life-sustaining conditions that human beings have enjoyed throughout the Holocene. So we're now dumping about 152 million tons of global warming pollutants into the atmosphere every 24 hours, which include uh, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, 
and of course methane. And the more of that global warming gas that gets into the atmosphere, the more of that outgoing infrared radiation gets trapped, trapping a huge amount of extra uh, heat and energy in the atmosphere. So the largest source of global warming pollution is uh, incontrovertibly the burning of fossil fuels. Um, if you look at the fourth national climate assessment released by President Trump's administration, uh, it says human activities are the dominant cause, and there are no credible natural explanations. This is down to us, and this is down to us burning fossil fuels, and we're having extraordinary uh, results. 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have occurred since 2001. The five hottest years of all time are the last five years. Uh, in New York, uh, we're up about two degrees Fahrenheit. Most of the country's up about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. We're up five degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. You may have heard in 2018, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, put out a really stark warning in which they said, the climate crisis requires rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented action. We have until 2030 to make sure that the temperature rise globally doesn't go above two degrees Celsius. And if we don't achieve that, uh, we're in a lot of trouble. Based on that, based on that science, as Haley just mentioned, uh, New York State passed the CLCPA and is trying to uh, fight the climate crisis. So, Dan Scammer, run on natural gas or fracked gas, which is a collection of compounds the largest one of which is methane, CH4. It's argued that natural gas is supposedly a cleaner energy than coal, but really is it, according to a study published by the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, burning natural gas is only better than burning coal if fugitive emissions are retained below 3.2%. And there are a lot of studies that say that there are a lot more fugitive emissions than that, which really calls into question this idea of it being uh, a, a cleaner energy source. You know, if you have two teenage boys and one of their rooms is slightly less messy than the other ones, that doesn't mean his room is clean. It just means it's slightly less filthy. So fugitive methane is the methane that escapes all along the uh, process from drilling to electrification through the pipelines, uh, through the compressor stations, etc. U.S. oil and gas operations are uh, leaking, I can't even see my thing, significantly more methane uh, than the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency had previously calculated, about 13 million uh, extra tons per year, according to the journal Science. Just in February of this year, the journal Nature said methane emissions from oil and gas may be significantly underestimated in terms of their percentage of the total methane uh, in the atmosphere. So why does that matter? The reason it matters is methane is 84 times as potent a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide is in the first 20 years of its release into the atmosphere. I'm gonna say that again, methane <laughs> is 84 times as potent a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide, 84 times during its first 20 years of release into the atmosphere. And of course, as we remember, the IPCC has said we have nine and a half years to curb uh, global temperature rise. So 93% of all of that extra heat energy uh, is trapped in the world's oceans. The uh, global ocean temperatures last year in 2019 were the hottest they have ever been on record. And this has big effects. As you probably know, cyclonic events, hurricanes, typhoons, cyclones, get much more powerful when they go over warmer water. But what normally happens is uh, that hurricane, for example, will dredge up water from the depths that's colder. But that's not happening now because we're making the ocean so much hotter. So in the case of Hurricane Harvey, uh, it went over water seven degrees warmer than normal. And that water was seven degrees warmer, warmer than normal to a depth of 200 meters. So it was just churning up 
hot, hot water, super fueling that cyclonic event. In most of Houston, Harvey's five-day rain total was a one in 25,000 year event. In some nearby areas, it was a one in 400,000 year event. So when you're considering uh, Dan Scammer, and you're considering um, you know, floodplains, 30-year floodplains and 100-year floodplains, we maybe should be thinking a little bit further. By the way, new data out from the First Street Foundation, it was just put out in an article in the uh, New York Times this week, says that about actually more than twice as many properties uh, in Orange County are prone to flooding than in the FEMA estimates. So this is the path that Hurricane Sandy took. It went over waters nine degrees warmer than normal before slamming into New York and New Jersey. There was a 13 foot storm surge that moved up the uh, East River. Now, according to scientists, the risk of a Hurricane Sandy intensity event in 1880 was a one in 500 year event. In 2017, it was a one in 25 year event. Scientists are now telling us by 2030 to 2045, it will be a one in five year event. And we know because the Hudson River is not really a river, it's a tidal estuary south of Troy, that what happens in the river, uh, you know, uh, towns that are by the side of the river experience terrible flooding issues in these kind of events. You should also know the warmer air can hold a lot more water vapor. So for every one degree Celsius rise, uh, the atmosphere's capacity to hold water vapor <clears throat> increases by 7%. There's already 5% more water vapor over the world's oceans than there was just 30 years ago. And that water vapor can travel great distances, causing bigger uh, and, and more intense downpours. New York State has seen a 71% increase in extreme precipitation events since 1958. On top of that, Antarctica is losing ice six times as fast as it was just 40 years ago. February 20th, uh, the temperature was 69.4 degrees in Antarctica. So we're seeing major melting of Antarctica, Greenland, uh, the glaciers, all that water has to go somewhere. The top 10 cities at risk from sea level rise by 2070 by asset uh, New York, Newark is number three. Already, sea level in New York Harbor is 15 inches higher than it was just in 1900. Uh, there's $129 billion worth of New York City real estate that lies in flood zones now. According to the DEC, the Mid-Hudson region could see a 71-inch rise in the Hudson River by the end of this century. Put on top of that increased precipitation, put on top of that more powerful and frequent storms, driving storm surges up the river, and you understand why the question of flooding becomes uh, extraordinary and imminent and deeply, deeply important. Thank you uh, for letting me speed through that. I'm turning it over to Haley now. Thanks, Tim. And uh, here I am again. I'm going to start sharing my screen. As Tim mentioned, we're a little uh, over on time, so I'll try to go through this quickly on a different topic this time. Um, I'll be speaking about some of the myths that you might be hearing um, out there about the new Dan's Camera proposal, a lot of them being, um, you know, propagated out there by Dan's Camera themselves. Some other folks are sort of hearing and, and adopting as true. Um, and I want to go through a couple of the biggest ones. Certainly, there are more than I'll cover here today. Um, and just talk about, you know, why this project isn't as nice as some of the uh, rhetoric out there might have you believe. And the first one I think is the biggest one and the one that a lot of people are hearing and a lot of people are thinking, well, yeah, maybe that's true, is that a new uh, dance camera plant will reduce emissions compared to the old existing plant that's been there for um, nearly 60 years, leading to cleaner air and fewer climate warming greenhouse gases. And that is absolutely unequivocally untrue. Here you see these charts which are created with data from Dan's Cameras Article 10 application. This is not data that Cena Cutson or um, another expert came up with. This is data from Dan's Cameras application, um, just put in a graphical form that shows the current plant's average emissions over a two-year recent period from 2014 to 2016 um, compared to what the projected annual average emissions would be 
from the existing plant. And I've just chosen here a few of the uh, different pollutants that were evaluated. Um, several of these are pollutants known to cause respiratory issues, including asthma and add to mortality and bad outcomes from those illnesses. And you can see how dramatically these pollutants are expected to rise with the new plant, up to 25 times more uh, in the case of particulate matter, which is one of the worst out there in terms of lung diseases. Um, and the reason for this is, you know, clearly the new plant built sometime in the 2020s is going to be much more efficient uh, at burning gas than the old plant. That's true, but it's going to run, as Mana mentioned earlier, so much more often than the existing plant. The existing one barely runs, and therefore the pollution is much less than Dan Skimmer itself predicts pollution will be from the new plant. And speaking of climate change, uh, as Tim was just talking about, here you see the current plants, again, annual average emissions uh, of greenhouse gases compared to the new plants projected annual average emissions. That is an over 40 fold increase from the existing plant dramatic increase because the new one is expected to run nearly all the time as what they call a base load facility versus the current peaking plant that only runs a handful of times a year. So how is Dan's camera possibly claiming that the new plant is cleaner? How can they do that? Um, well, they're really relying on some modeling projections to show that, and this is a quote from their application, but basically they're saying, well, our, our plant, once it's up and running, because it's running so often, it's going to offset other older, dirtier sources, and they're not going to run because we're running. That's the way the New York uh, electricity system works. So overall, the air is going to be cleaner. But their words are misleading here. You got to read the fine print, like with so many things. Um, when they say regional basis, they don't mean Orange County. They don't mean the Hudson Valley. They don't mean New York State. Regional is defined in their application as New York, all of the New England states, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and, and Ontario, Canada as well. When you take into account that enormous area, some of their modeling, which I'll mention in a moment, we think is erroneous um, and doesn't paint an accurate picture, then they can say that the air might be a bit cleaner, taking all of that into consideration with some of their false assumptions I'll talk about in a minute. But even then, even with their modeling, which we think is again biased and in error, within the state of New York, Dan Skimmer admits in its application, if you look at the whole state, but not all those other states in Canada, greenhouse gas emissions with the new plant are still Dan's camera's own modeling, again, projected to increase over 300,000 tons per year with the new plant over the current situation with the old plant and everything else that's running, you know, as of the moment they submitted their application in December 2019. Um, with that intervener funding, I mentioned earlier, Scenic Hudson and some of the other uh, parties to the Article 10 proceeding have hired um, an energy economics firm to look at some of these claims to do their own modeling. That work is just um, at the very, very beginning, so we don't have the final results. Um, I'll be really excited when we do to share them with you, but here are just some preliminary thoughts from Synapse, just looking at the data, looking at Dan's camera's application. The, they modeled the energy system with only one large-scale renewable energy project in the entire state of New York. One large-scale renewable project. There's currently four projects fully permitted and under construction and several dozen in the queue. That is not reality that there'll be one renewable project. They also, as I mentioned before, inappropriately included a very wide geographic area, which is not typical and really shows how they're trying to skew their modeling to paint a favorable picture. On to the next, myth number two, Dan's camera won't use fracked gas. That's something that Dan's camera itself has said. Again, completely untrue. It is true that Dan's camera's gas will be supplied by Central Hudson's general distribution, gas distribution system. You know, uh, Dan Skimmer doesn't have a contract with one particular um, extraction company. They just get the gas from Central Hudson. That's true, but all of that gas comes, almost all of that gas comes from Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia, and every bit of gas coming from those places is extracted via fracking techniques. And as was mentioned earlier, more than two thirds of natural gas, even across the nation, comes from fracking. We really are not getting gas through traditional extraction methods in the country generally, and definitely not in New York and in the Northeast. That gas is going to be fracked gas coming from the frack fields in Pennsylvania and Ohio for the most part, and all of the terrible impacts that go along with that. 
Myth number three, the new dance camera project will create hundreds of local jobs. There will be an estimated 23 permanent jobs at the plant, which is about exactly the same as at the current plant. There'll be 23 permanent jobs. There will be a few hundred temporary construction jobs for about one to two years while the project's being built. It would be a big plant. It would take a lot of construction uh, job, uh, guys out there. But most of these are specialized jobs and they are almost certain to come from out of the area. They are highly specialized. Building a combined cycle gas turbine plant uh, is a very specialized thing. And these folks come from out of state. They're very specialized tradesmen. It's not the general local laborers that are going to be doing the bulk of this work. And if you want to look to other recent natural gas projects that were built in the Hudson Valley over the past five to six years that also promised a lot of local jobs, you can go back, you can look in the papers. That's what folks were promised. They, the vast majority of their labor was out of state. And that's now documented and we've got plenty of photos of, of the cars um, at the construction sites, all with out of state plates. These are not going to be, for the most part, local jobs. And finally, myth number four. The new dance camera project can run on clean hydrogen energy. This is sort of a, a new thing that dance camera has been putting out there and saying, yeah, yeah, natural gas, but you know what? Our project could run on renewable clean hydrogen too. And you know, that's a, a clean running fuel and that could be part of a, a clean energy future. This is a completely theoretical thing that maybe possibly could happen at some point in the distant future. It is not part of Dan's camera's plans. Nowhere in their regulatory filings or any other official documents do they ever mention hydrogen. They say the plant's going to run on natural gas. It'll have diesel backup fuel. That's what the plant's going to run on, not hydrogen. Hydrogen power is really only a theoretical uh, way to create power at this point. It does show some future promise. It does look like an exciting possible new frontier in renewable energy, but it is not close to ready to being on the market. There is no way that Dan's camera is going to come in in the next 5, 10, 15 years and say, oh, we're going to convert to hydrogen. There are no hydrogen plants currently operating. There is a first of its kind kind of pilot plant under development in Los Angeles. Um, and the hopes of the company there uh, are that it could be 100% hydrogen maybe in 10 or 20 years. And that's the first of its kind. This is a speculative technology um, probably well worth investing in and looking at for the future, but this is not what Dan's camera will ever, ever run on. Um, and there you see that there's a lot of uh, infrastructure that would be needed in order to make hydrogen uh, fueled power plants be um, economic and feasible. There are a lot of things that go along with that. Maybe it's something we can look to in the future. It's not something that is ever going to happen with Dan's camera's current plans, though. That's just a complete fallacy. And that is the end of my presentation on fact versus fiction. Thank you so much, Haley. That was really, really amazing. Um, so now we're gonna hear from um, some elect officials on this issue. Um, we've had a lot of really great um, opposition to this plant coming from, from elected leaders in our community. Um, so first we are gonna hear from um, we're going to hear a clip from Senator Jen Metzger, who spoke at a recent rally of ours, um, explaining that Dan Scammer is not compatible with climate leadership, with the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Thanks for having me. And um, I'm, I'm really pleased to be here to say a few words on a subject that I am very passionate about. Uh, I, uh, represent the 42nd district in the New York State Senate, which includes Sorry about that. Um, Santosh, do you want me to try to play it from my, let me play it, maybe play it from my computer? <laughs> yeah, sure. Some yeah, I don't know what happened. Okay. 
Um, share screen. And um, I'm really pleased to be here to say a few words on a subject that I am very passionate about. Uh, I uh, represent the 42nd District in the New York State Senate, which includes uh, part of Ulster County, part of Orange County, uh, part of Delaware County, and all of Sullivan County. Uh, and I uh, proudly hail from the town of Rosendale. So, the science on climate change is clear and has been clear for some time. We have to drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions caused primarily by the burning of fossil fuels in order to lessen the severity of climate change and its impacts here in New York, across the country, and around the globe. We can make the world a lot more habitable for our children and their children by the actions we take today. And truly to ignore the science and continue with business as usual is frankly irresponsible. New York State has taken the lead nationally in recognizing this responsibility and acting on it. Last year, we passed the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which sets the most forward-looking targets in the country to reduce energy economy. New York has committed in law to achieving a carbon-free electricity system by 2040 with an interim goal of meeting 70% of our electricity needs from renewable energy by 2030. We have a long way to go in a very short period of time to meet these goals. And it simply makes no sense to invest in fossil fuel infrastructure with a useful lifespan of 50 years or more when we have committed to being entirely off fossil fuels long before that. Now, do we need the power today that the proposed dance camera plant would provide? In other words, do we have to worry about whether we're generating enough electricity to meet current demand? Is there a reliability issue here? And the answer is no. The New York Independent System Operator, which is the organization charged with managing New York's electricity grid and ensuring grid reliability, has, de has determined that existing resources are adequate to meet electricity demand now and for the next 10, 10 years, even after taking into account the closure of Indian Point. So instead of building another frack gas power plant, let's create the energy system we need. New York recently passed legislation as part of the 2021, 2021 budget to accelerate investments in large scale renewable energy, which will create many, many good paying jobs. We also need to greatly ramp up investments in energy efficiency to reduce consumption, consumption and this too will create many good paying jobs. There is a huge opportunity for our state to create a truly sustainable energy economy. So let's keep moving forward and not backward. Thank you. All right, great. Um, next, uh, we are going to hear from um, Kevin Darian Lujan, Orange County legislator, uh, to give us a Newburgh perspective on this. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank all of you for, for organizing this. and. Obviously, this is this is how we get the word out about uh, kind of answering and responding to to the false information which is which is out there. Um, you know, there, I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of, some others have, have already said, um, but I want to bring the the Newburgh perspective and, and really bring it to to where we are. Um, I, I'm proud to represent uh, the city of Newburgh and a portion of the town Newburgh uh, in Orange County. Um, it is the city of Newburgh is a population of about 30,000 people. Um, it's the, one of the most diverse communities in the Hudson Valley, very, very large Latino and African-American population. Um, it's, it's one of those, those cities that, uh, that unfortunately um, over the decades has, has fallen on hard times and, and thankfully is, 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 is on the rise. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of really great things going on in the city of Newburgh, but there's still a lot that's hurting us. Um, you know, just to talk about social issues um, and, and, and health issues, um, as was said before, we unfortunately have many people that suffer from asthma. Um, we have many people who are suffering from, from heart disease. 
Um, with COVID-19, we are currently the number one uh, community in Orange County with, with confirmed cases. Um, these are the individuals who, even after um, they no longer have symptoms, will still continue to have respiratory issues. And here we are talking about not only the health issues and the health impacts, um, but also about who is being impacted in places across the country. Well, if, if COVID-19 has identified one thing is, is that unfortunately, it is precisely uh, uh, people of color, uh, Latinos and African Americans that are unfortunately uh, facing uh, disproportionately impacted by, by this, this, this illness. But that's not the only thing that, that we see. We see it in everything. Now we look at also the issues that we already have. We look at the lead issues that we have in, in our homes, we ha in, in our water, the issues that we have with PFOS and PFOA. This is a community that is at the crossroads of so many environmental challenges, a true environmental justice community that, that has been ignored for countless, countless decades. Now we wanna create a plant. We wanna create a, we wanna add and expand a plant that's going to be running more. It's gonna be running basically all the time that's going to increase greenhouse gases, that's going to create more pollution, that's not going to only impact our communities, but all the neighboring communities around us. It, it's obvious from the, the, the communities that have come out that this is clearly not a popular uh, project. I was proud to see so many of our local communities stand up, uh, from Beacon to Poughkeepsie, from the city of Newburgh, all of our, our city council members coming and standing and saying, you know what? We are not short-sighted. We will not stand for short-term gains and, and fill our, our coffers just because, of it, because there's money being thrown at us. We want to make sure that we're aiming for sustainable solutions, sustainable projects. And that's what it comes down to. This project is being sold as, as a project which is going to benefit the workers of, of, of places like the city of Newburgh. And let me tell you, the city of Newburgh, among the other main things that we, that we, that we struggle with is high unemployment. So if, if health issues wasn't enough, if transportation issue wasn't enough, we also face some of the highest unemployment in the region. And sure, we would love and appreciate to have great paying jobs, but we also want to have sustainable paying jobs. We want to have the jobs that are not going to poison our neighbors and our loved ones. They're not going to ruin the beautiful landscape and beautiful communities that we are so proud to be a part of. And that's unfortunately not what this project is, going, is, is offering. It, they come in offering uh, you know, to bus people in from the city of Newburgh to, to, to a plant in the town. But the reality is their work has not shown that. And the reality is, is that the impact that it's going to have on our community far outweighs any of the, of the benefits that are being proposed. We're talking about decades of long impact. That is not the kind of legacy I wanna leave as a legislator, as an elected official, as a neighbor, as a community leader. And that is not the one that I hope that any of our other elected officials would wanna leave at all as well. And thankfully thus far from what I've noticed, the voices have spoken. And I stand proudly with every single one of you in saying that I am absolutely unequivocally against this project because it is not the legacy I would wanna leave for any of my children in the future or any of your children in the future. This is not the project that we need. We need a sustainable project that's going to focus on 10, 20 years from now. Why are we spending millions of dollars on a project that will become obsolete when we can be spending it on the kind of projects, the bold initiatives that we're seeing across, across the country and across the world, why are we not thinking towards the future? Why do we keep getting stuck in our own way, proposing the same kind of projects that only poison our neighbors and destroy our landscapes and our communities? Once again, I thank you for doing this and uh, I, I continue to, to, to be a very proud support of all the work that you're all doing. And um, I, I'm proud to be with you for the years coming. And hopefully we'll, we won't be doing this and, and this, this plan will be taken down. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Um, and next, we're going to hear from Amber Grant, uh, Beacon City Council uh, member whose careful deliberations led to unanimous bipartisan opposition um, it, to this expansion of fossil fuel infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to speak a bit about process. In August of 2019, our city council unanimously passed a resolution opposing the new plant 
But prior to passing that resolution, we had a lengthy public discussion at a council meeting with representatives from Food and Water Watch, Scenic Hudson, Laborers International Union, Dan Scammer, and community members. And I think that's a really important point that this conversation was held in public so that the questions the council was asking and the discussions being had were transparent. Um, it wasn't an agreement reached behind closed doors. It was something that we did out in the open. Um, there were many points of view to consider and each of those parties was given ample time. They were able to present information in any format that they wanted to. Um, and as I mentioned, answer questions from the council. We had a really large audience for these discussions. We had some demonstrations from, from both sides outside of City Hall before our meetings. And um, it was at times a little contentious, but it was um, certainly worth that, that process. And I believe our resolution was one of the earlier oppositions and has been used by other communities. We walked through many of the viewpoints, including those supporting the build out. It's important to be balanced when you're presenting your case. Um, we also stated that we would fully consider the findings of the Article 10 process, but for us to have a positive recommendation on this, we'd need to see a demonstration of necessity and an inability to provide any alternative energy sources with lesser impacts. And we also requested and received status as an interested party in the Article 10 process. So we continue to be um, pretty involved in this and are weighing in uh, along the way. And I'll also mention that while I'm very passionate about sustainability, it was concerned community members who really highlighted this issue for me. So I want to encourage everybody to reach out to your representatives and ask them to take a, a position. We really do listen to you. Um, and if it hadn't been for uh, some of my constituents spending that time with me to help me understand this issue. You know, I, I really appreciate that. So, so encourage so much, you. Thank you, Amber. Um, next, uh, we're gonna turn it over to the labor perspective. Um, so, uh, Santosh, if you wanna try your luck again with the tech. Uh, we're gonna hear from Sandra Oxford and um, Rob Pinto. This was during, um, a uh, uh, an event back in May on May Day. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Craig. Now I have the uh, great occasion to introduce another labor leader here from our area, Rob Pinto, CWA 1120. He is the assistant to the president. And um, more than anything, Rob is one of these people who has always been part of the boots on the ground and just getting involved where the grass meets the roots. But he's also, through his leadership at the Dutchess County Central Labor Council, been an inspirational person. Our movement, the labor movement, is really reliant on people who have a vision and who are able to move others in the right direction. And in many ways, Rob Pinto has offered that to our movement because he tends to be one of those people who reaches for the best in us. And I really appreciate his stewardship of our beloved community. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Sandy. Um, you are a, uh, a, a true value to the area and I thank you for all you've done. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, happy uh, May Day to everyone. Uh, happy International Workers Day. Uh, it's a great day for us, it's a great day for labor. It's a somber day also, but it, it's, it's a day for the worker. Uh, I'd also be remiss if I didn't uh, mention our brothers and sisters at Teamsters 445 out uh, um, social distancing, picketing uh, the uh, new Amazon warehouse in uh, the Hudson Valley. Uh, Amazon is a prime example uh, and the antithesis of what we want to accomplish here and what we're striving for here with this collective. Uh, the transition to a rene renewable energy market is an opportunity for labor, business, and environmental groups uh, to unite. Uh, the reality is renewable energy is the future. Uh, labor has a clear path to help lead this transformation. The failure or success of a just transition depends on connections, flexibility, uh, and communication between all of us. Uh, 
the future is the future of labor is woven into a just transition. The future of labor depends on a just transition. Um, the roadmap for us, the roadmap for transition, depends on our environmental groups, um, labor groups, businesses, and the community uh, breaking out of our silos. Uh, each of us has our own silos. We get stuck in sometimes. We need to break out of those silos and come together for the common good for the collective. Um, far too often, we've been at different sides of the table on this and fighting against each other on this. this is, I thank Mana. I can't thank Mana enough for bringing us all to the table together. And, and this is the way to move forward. All of us together, uh, we, we have strength and we can move this forward in a positive way. And it's good for the collective. Um, you know, labor is going to be a forefront of this, and I think they, we, we should be at the forefront for this. Uh, you know, we're going to be using, pro, you know, project labor agreements uh, to build these factories or these facilities. Uh, we're going to uh, bargain gr uh, good wages, fair wages, good benefits, and that will benefit the community because if the community has good jobs based on this, uh, they have a stake in the market here, which is really what we want. Um, and I, I believe that the transition, uh, just transition is a way to, to save this economy also. Um, obviously COVID has taken its, its toll on this economy. Uh, you know, millions of jobs have been lost and you know, no pressure, but I think this is a, a chance to save not only the economy, but this planet. And I think this is a, a great opportunity uh, we're, we're having here. And, it, and it's an awful thing that's happened with this COVID, but it's an opportunity. Uh, this is really uh, where we can we can save the world and save the economy. No pressure, anyone. Uh, you know, the poor and the working class, uh, we're labor. The poor and the working class are our bread and butter. And the poor and the working class are disproportionately affected by, by climate change. We as labor have a responsibility. I mean, uh, our founding principle is an injury to one is an injury to all. So this is why labor has a responsibility. We have a responsibility to be in the forefront of this transition, to lead, uh, be a part of the leadership, be a part of the, the, the discussion. Yeah. All right, great. Um, thank you, Santosh. So with that, um, and, and thank you to those, you know, labor voices, they're not here, but we appreciate um, they're contributing their video. Um, so next, uh, we're going to hear a Rockland citizen's perspective. Rick for chase um, Executive Director of Stony Point Center. Thank you so much, Rick. Thank you, Emily. It's great to be with all of you. I really appreciate the work that you and so many others have done to pull this conversation together this afternoon, in part because it's an education for me, as I expect it is for so many of us, to see the numbers, the statistics, and to kind of learn exactly what's, what we're up against in this particular fight against Dan Scammer. And I just want to speak from the perspective of someone who's now lived in Rockland County since 2008. Um, I came to this county committed on environmental issues in a, theor in a theoretical way. And the story I want to share very briefly is uh, what took place here at Stony Point uh, and at Stony Point Center in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy. Uh, we went down to the local Ambulance Corps building two nights after uh, Hurricane Sandy overtook our community. We had an 11 foot storm surge here that is clearly and definitively a direct result of climate change. And it, uh, it displaced about 150 people who are the poorest people in our little town of Stony Point who were living in mobile homes at the river's edge, literally. And uh, almost all of them were forced out of their homes in the first and second nights of the, after the storm. We went down to find out what was going on and discovered they had no place to go. And we literally opened up our 90 guest room conference center and welcomed everyone in, uh, in on the spur of the moment. And many of those families lived with us for the next three weeks. We had, or three months, I'm sorry. We had uh, more than 120 people who lived here and they became friends and family to us. The school buses picked their kids up here in the front circle in front of Stony Point each morning and dropped them off each afternoon, at which point we would give them snacks and do tutoring and uh, we fed people, we did job counseling, we tried to help them sort their way through the process with FEMA, we did all of it. And what really mattered to me in that process was learning about real people's lives who were being impacted in real ways as a result of climate change. So whatever I may believe about the impact of particular uh, pollution that's happening in this valley on, in the Hudson River on a daily basis up and down the river and the need to try and fight it, What's also really clear to me is that we have to personalize and give face to the impact of climate change. 
that the people who are being uprooted by this climate change are going to be the poorest and the most vulnerable time after time after time. So I'm grateful for all of the organizing that you folks are doing. I commit myself as a business manager in this county, trying desperately to make it seem safe to come here for outside tourist dollars, which is no easy thing given the environmental crises that we keep opening ourselves up to here. I continue to commit myself to that work. We'll do that work and we'll be a home to the effort here at Stony Point Center. So that's an open invitation to all of you to use us as a home and a place to have these conversations. We're looking forward to being partners in the project. Thank you so much, Rick. We appreciate you you joining the fight and being part of this. Um, so with that, we're gonna we're gonna turn it over to Q and A. Um, the uh, attendees who RSVP'd, we got some really great questions. Um, we weren't able to answer all of them, but um, hopefully, you know, we'll be in touch with you after to answer any of your questions if we if we're not able to answer them um, right here. So. Um, with that, we're gonna start with um, the first question uh, for Rick and Amber. What is the importance um, and significance of local municipalities passing resolutions like one against Dan Scammer? Um, whoever wants to start. Amber, you wanna jump in? Sure, so, um, it, you know, I'll say I think it's important for elected officials to use their voices for good on a regular basis. Um, it does carry a certain weight with decision makers because we're speaking for a large body of community members. So we're aggregating those voices into one message. And, and I do think there is some power behind that. Um, it also gives other municipalities a framework and a little political push to do the same. Uh, I think in our, in our area here, once we passed the first resolution, we started to see more and more of them come. So uh, it gives everybody else a, a little kind of firming up to, <laughs> to get out there and, and take a stand as well. And I'll just add to that, that uh, the town of Stony Point is a small town of 14,000 people located about 25 miles south of Newburgh. And it is not known for its liberal politi politics or liberal tendencies. But part of what I've learned over the last 10 years of uh, being involved in environmental movement and environmental struggle is that in this county, or in, this, in this part of our county, this is actually the uniting issue. That there are many issues that divide our community, but in fact, um, when people talk about what it means to have a sustainable economy, I'm right there with them. And um, when people talk about being concerned about their job disappearing, I want to be, and so as we've been working these kinds of overtures to our town, it actually gives us the opportunity to lift up a conversation and have it together as a full community and not just try and um, kind of snipe at one another from the sidelines. So I think this is actually among the most critical strategies that we could bring to bear. Great. Um, also, we were thinking, um, Kevin Darian, would you also like to, to say a few words about this? Hi, sorry, I was uh, I was away. <laughs> no, it's okay. It was we threw it on you. <laughs> so, I'm actually really happy that, about what Amber said because that's precisely what we're seeing uh, with this movement. Is that we we saw it it just really snowballed across across the region, um, and that's what and that's what we're seeing with a lot of movements. A lot of the the great things that we're seeing in Albany. Um, they didn't start off, you know, it didn't start in Albany. It started with, with neighbors and, and regular people just coming together and saying, hey, listen, we need you to act on this. And then it went to municipalities and it went from municipalities to counties and it went from counties to the, to the state. And that's the beautiful organic thing about these movements. I can tell you as a legislator, I was looking very attentively at what was going on in Beacon what was going on in, in the town of Newburgh, what was going on in Ulster County. Um, I spoke, um, you know, on a panel in regards to the vote in Ulster County, because not just on this issue, but on so many others, we have seen Ulster County lead the way on environmental issues. And that's what we do as leaders. We look at our great leaders across the region and beyond, and we, and we try to embolize those kind of, those kind of great work. And, and that's what it comes down to. And, it, and again, I want to, you know, highlight what Amber said. It's, the, if it wasn't for the community members, the ones that come out and say, hey, listen, this matters to me, you know, help us learn about this even better. You know, that's, that's what it comes down to. We want to stand with you. We want to work with you. Um, and I also just want to end with saying this. 
and, and you know, it's, it's, it's rare to see it, but you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a progressive Democrat, but I can tell you, this is not a democratic issue. This is in no way, shape or form whatsoever, a party issue, a political issue. In the legislature, unfortunately, in Orange County, it did, it did unfortunately pass. But can I tell you that we had both Democrats and Republicans that stood in opposition to this project. And for anyone who is in a district which is more conservative, I want you to be very, very clear on this. This will impact your homes. This will impact the safety and, and, uh, of, your, of your communities. This will affect your air quality. This is not a, a political issue. This is about leaving a legacy of clean air for you, for your families, for your, 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 your children's children. And that's what it comes down to. And so it really comes down to all of us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, all right, next question. Is this needed? How long will investors have to pay? Um, what are the effects on rates and effects on the environment? Um, this one is for Haley, Carla. Sure, thanks, Emily. And there was a lot of questions um, rolled into one there. And I think we've covered pretty well the impacts on the environment. Certainly there's more that could be said. Um, on the issue of need for the project, I think Senator Metzger had a few great words on that, referring to the New York Independent System Operators Report, um, which analyzed our system and found that even with no Indian point, with expected closures, we don't need Dan's camera to keep the lights on, to keep things reliable. We've got multiple transmission lines under development explicitly to help bring renew excess renewable energy that currently exists upstate and western New York downstate where the load centers are in and around New York City. Um, this is something that New York State has um, been planning for a long time in terms of opening up those bottlenecks, developing additional renewable resources. Um, there is nobody credible out there uh, who is saying that a new dance camera plant is really needed to keep the lights on and to keep rates reasonable. Just nobody's saying that because it's absolutely not the case. Um, and as, as far as rates go, um, I've seen different things out there, and this is not expected to lower rates at all. Some folks think it will increase rates. Um, and again, going back to what Mana said at the beginning of the presentation, the whole reason that the developer wants to build this plan is because they get those capacity payments through the FERC process, whether or not they're actually needed, whether or not they're selling a megawatt of electricity to the grid, they're going to make millions simply for existing and being able to turn on if they're ever needed. Um, they're going to recoup that money from ratepayers, even if ratepayers never even see any energy from the plan. Um, thank you. Um, all right, this one is for Mana. Uh, please cover strategy information for addressing power needs with renewables. Yeah. Um, first of all, I want to say that New York's um, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act has amongst the most um, ambitious goals. And they've already convened two meetings of the Climate Action Council, but their process is going to take up to three years. Uh, and then to meet the 2030 goals, uh, they'll be seven years to achieve that and uh, another 10 years to achieve um, uh, full renewal, a uh, transition to full renewable in uh, by by 2040, and uh, really strict greenhouse gas re emission reductions. But here in the Hudson Valley, we're working with the Hudson Valley Regional Council and the Mid Hudson Regional Planning Coalition, Sustainability Coalition, um, to create a seven county regional renewable energy implementation plan. And we want to have that done this year and start implementing it next year. In the meantime, there's a lot going on already because the, um, electri the industry realizes, and there was just an article uh, in, that said that the, the that renewables are a safe bet and that because of the recent um, pipeline closures and including the Williams pipeline and, and DAPL and, and others, um, the industry is not sure about investing in fossil fuel anymore 
but they know that renewables are a sure thing uh, for the future. So there's a real shift occurring and we want the Hudson Valley to show the same kind of leadership that, for example, Long Island with their solar roadmap uh, is already developing and we're gonna develop something similar in the Hudson Valley so that we're ahead of the curve and ready to implement the goals of the community leadership, uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act uh, and, and actually transition to a renewable energy economy. Thank you. Um, all right, now this one is for um, Haley. How will this affect our overall health in the Newburg, um, in the Newburg region, Newburg area? Sure, thanks, thanks Emily. Um, and I wanna direct everyone to, we actually had a whole webinar on the impacts of Dance Camera on public health um, about a month ago, two months ago now, geez, time is flying. Um, but we had a whole webinar about that and we had um, several great speakers, including um, legislator Lou Hahn, uh, who is here today with us, um, and also Dr. David Carpenter, who is the director of the SUNY Institute for Public Health and the Environment. He's a medical doctor um, with some great credentials. And I'm going to drop the link to that webinar in the chat, um, because you don't have to take my word for it. You can hear directly from Dr. Carpenter exactly what he thinks the impact of this plant would be on public health. But just to summarize what he said, um, the plant is expected, as I mentioned before, to increase levels of pollutants that are known to cause, contribute to, and exacerbate uh, numerous health conditions, um, including respiratory illnesses, but also um, cardiac illnesses uh, and neurological illnesses. Those pollutants are known to cause these things. They're expected to increase dramatically. We already know that the city of Newburgh in particular and the surrounding area has a much higher rate than average and the surrounding area um, of these respiratory illnesses and specifically of mortality from them. So they're already suffering uh, at a greater rate than the general public. This is just gonna increase air pollution and increase those negative public health outcomes. And again, look in the chat, check out our webinar from um, May 6th and hear it right from Dr. Carpenter, exactly what he thinks the impacts of this plant could be on public health. Great, thank you. Um, all right, now um, we are gonna hear from Mana again. What role does river water play in plant operation? Does the plant have to be close to the river? The new facility does not. The current facility is on the river and is having detrimental effects uh, on the Hudson River because power plants require cooling systems, that is, uh, fossil fuel power plants and um, nuclear power plants where uh, combustion or heat is generated. Um, a solar power plant does not. But um, do not. But in, it does not need to be on the river because um, it's using a an air cooling system. So the new, new plant would not need to be on the river, uh, but it does not need to be at all. We don't need this facility. The other issue is that um, I mentioned that the hillside, if you wanted to get to a higher elevation and get out of a flood prone area, you might think of moving it back along that hillside. But that hillside is a large coal ash landfill. And I don't believe there's enough uh, property at the top. Uh, but the main thing is um, the facility is not needed at all. So even though uh, the proposal, the proposed facility would have less impact on the river and would not need Hudson River for its cooling system, uh, we believe the facility is not needed and is, as several people have said, um, the risks out and the harm outweighs the benefits. Great. Um, lastly, um, but certainly not least, really important question. How can we convince Governor Cuomo um, to prevent this plant from being built as he is the man in charge. Um, Tim, can you answer that one? Um, 
So I think there, there's a bunch of uh, approaches on this. Number one is there, I think there's a real legal question around the CLCPA, and I think Man will talk about that in a second. Uh, but I think in terms of our national conversation right now, placing this plant, uh, intentionally citing this polluting plant that's going to have deleterious health effects on a population uh, which has already uh, suffered uh, an overwhelming burden of health effects from uh, drinking water issues uh, falls into uh, you know, environmental racism, environmental justice. In the middle of our national conversation about racism, you know, one of the things that uh, environmental racism is all, also called is slow violence, because it, 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 it does exactly what a, a knee on someone's neck does over a lot longer period of time. To put that burden back on the good people uh, of Newburgh, who have already suffered so much, is uh, unconscionable. I think that's one approach. The other uh, big approach, which was mentioned earlier, is the fact that um, this is a very expensive boondoggle based on uh, fossil, by the way, fossil fuel, we've seen four major pipelines get stalled out or stopped completely in the past couple of weeks. Why we would be investing in this is absolute madness. When we know, as our friend from the union mentioned, uh, the fastest growing job category in the United States is solar installer, predicted to be so through 2026, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Number two is wind turbine service technician. We're going to be in a terrible situation coming out of the COVID crisis. If you really want to rebuild the economy, Mr. Governor, uh, embrace renewables. And one last really quick thing, if you want the folks in Albany to change, and my buddy Jeremy Cherson at Riverkeeper taught me this, they pay attention to Twitter. Of all insane things, I hate Twitter. Get on Twitter and tweet about Dan Scammer and tweet that you want them to stop it. Thanks. All right, thank you so much, Tim. Um, and thank you for everyone else who, who was here to answer these questions. Um, we're gonna we're gonna end uh, with a Q and or sorry with um with our call to action piece. Uh, Man is gonna go, go over some of this, um, but I, I think we're in a uh, we're, we ended that Q and A on a really good note to start talking about how we're gonna hold Governor Cuomo uh, accountable and 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 build power around this. So, Mana. Okay, so um, there are three basic steps that you can do uh, to stop the dance camera expansion. And the first is to ask your local government to pass a municipal resolution um, to Governor Cuomo to urge him to stop the dance camera expansion. And here's a list of the municipalities that have already uh, passed resolutions. So, uh, and, and right now, there's a resolution in front of Rockland County to urging them to say no to the dance camera expansion. It's been introduced by uh, Rockland County legislator um, and environmental chair, Harriet Cornell. And if you're a resident of Rockland County, please reach out to the Rockland County legislature and we will provide a, a quick link for generating an email and that'll be posted in the chat and shared with you after uh, anyone who's registered and then you can play that forward. And then finally, um, you can sign a petition and there's a link in the chat uh, to Governor Cuomo and you can call him directly at this number, 888-925-7000. Seven zero zero six, and if you are an elected official, and I think we have some elected officials uh, watching today, sign the letter um, urging. And and if you're not an elected official, urge your elected officials to sign the letter. We have over a hundred elected officials that have signed that, 
and join upcoming events and rallies and so forth. So I think uh, there's lots we can do and um, we'll also send this information to you with a follow-up email. Um, so there are many things that can be done and uh, I'll turn it back to Emily uh, to thank everyone and sign off. And I'm deeply appreciate, appreciative of everyone who participated today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you everyone for coming. Um, thank you for joining us in this fight. Thank you for those who've been part of this with us um, for a while now. There's so much work to be done and um, so many ways to get involved. And again, um, if you were, if you had a question that wasn't answered or you have thoughts and ideas, um, we will be sharing follow-up um, email and correspondence and we'd love to speak with you, um, especially folks in Rockland County. Um, a lot of you may be just joining this fight and um, we really want you to uh, make your voice heard. Um, so thank you again. Uh, and I, I and thank you to all the panelists, and I hope you have a great rest of your night. Bye, everyone. Thank you.